Hello all. Okay, so I'm a little off on my timeline. I just up uploaded a video recently that I actually shot a couple weeks ago. Um, so a little late, sorry. I wanted to talk about books I've read since then. Well, I guess just circle back to two books real quick from my last video. I did finish Wayward Son by Rainbow Rowell and I mentioned in that video I introduced it as the sequel. At that to carry on, at that point in the book I was pretty sure there was gonna be another one that just hadn't been announced because one, there was a two on the spine and two, it just read very much like a middle book, the middle of a trilogy. And and that makes sense because Rainbow Rowell has been very open with, when she was designing these books, she talked about all of the chosen one narratives that we have and just how many she didn't realize she'd internalized in the way that she did. I know at the carry on uh, book tour, she talked about Star Wars a lot uh, so that made sense to me and it, it makes sense from the narrative arc and tropes she's approaching and challenging with these books to approach it that way. I think she's done a very wonderful job with that. Am I happy with where the second book left off? No. <laughs> Do I think it left off in the right place? Yes. I think it was very successful in what it did. I think it was very interesting in the magic systems it created, especially for America and contrasting that with the British magical systems. It's still playful and fun, but it feels very honest and also comments on a lot of things politically while keeping that fun tone. Also had my book club for Things We Lost in the Fire, which I know I like kind of just babbled on about last time. Again, I love the short story collection. I reread it, but I actually reread it on audio because I wasn't gonna, I was in the middle of a book that needed to go back to the library and I was like, oh, I'm really enjoying this. I don't wanna stop, even though I know I'm gonna really love this book. So I did it on audio. I used one of my Libro.fm credits. My only critique of the audio is that the short story collection, well, it is a short story collection, but the chapters aren't titled with the short story title so it would be like chapter whatever but it wouldn't tell me like oh you're in the middle of the inn or an invocation of the big eared runt like these are great stories but i i couldn't if i i couldn't remind myself where i was especially because i was listening at work so that would be my one critique excellent i didn't let my book club down they all loved it i had not forgotten how beautiful this collection was obviously because i raved about it but the language is just still so lush and gorgeous. So I I was I was reminding myself because this is horror and I am a scaredy cat. Um, easily scared. I wasn't so much scared as unsettled with these stories, but my book club talked about how scary they were. So she obviously sets the atmosphere very well, but I apparently react differently to horror in print versus normal. So there are definite, it's definitely a horror collection, but what I was reminding of as I read it is that there are all these ghosts lurking in the background and they're enticing and they're interesting and they're why I picked up the collection. But the scariest bits of this are the political bits. So there are ghosts in the forefront, but, but the politics in the background are the, are the scariest parts, I think. And I think that uh, Marina Enriquez just does a wonderful job of merging these two of it, it this is just a great collection and I will talk about it forever at the end so those are the two books that I kind of just wanted to swing back to and now I will talk about some of the things I've read since then so the first thing I read since then was the audiobook for Jacqueline Woodson's Red at the Bone I love Jacqueline Woodson I don't really know that there's much to say there I'm gonna pick up what she writes because it's Jacqueline Woodson and I didn't read the blurb before I put it on hold, I was a little surprised to hear the word, the name Melody come out early in the book because I'm not used to my name being in books. I think the last time was The Nest. Uh, so that was interesting. But it starts at Melody's like 16th kind of coming of age birthday and it explores her mother, her father, her grandparents and this family unit and how they came to be in this moment. It's, it's gorgeous. I listened to it on audio so I again so I can't say how it was laid out on the page but Jacqueline Woodson's language is always very lush and it listens very well I would be interested as she is a poet to see how she laid out the words on the page I just knew I would be able to get to the audio quicker so definitely recommend love Jacqueline Woodson there's there's a lot 
in that book um, about you know being a parent about family about what family means our our um, duties to family and our duties to ourselves the next book i read serpent and the dove by shelby malhern um this was a book that takes place in kind of like a pseudo um a pseudo medieval france at least that's how i read it about a young witch who has left her coven and the witch hunter that she becomes entangled with in her kind of bid to outpace her coven and the leader of that coven it was really good i really liked it i did struggle because it, it is a hate to love which is one of my favorite tropes and i'll be upfront about that and it is a slow burn but i did struggle with because i mean louise is a witch reed is a witch hunter and they play it plays a lot on kind of this nature of humanity and how we view people because uh reed is part of you know this church and the church i think it's very clearly the catholic church and does not view witches as people but so he doesn't know louise obviously is a witch for most of the book and it and it kind of begs the question of how do you navigate a romance or how can you fall in love with someone who doesn't even see you as a human and i struggled with that i think it did it did grapple with that right like we didn't just go right into things it took its the narrative took its time that's what this book wanted to explore it was digging into that so i think that it wasn't handled poorly but that was one of the main things that i grappled with while reading especially as i was like really enticed and seduced by this narrative it was everything i like uh you know there was banter it was hate to love it threw in like a sexy ginger as the love interest uh sexy gingers aren't required i just always appreciate them it's just it just did really well also i love witches um it it prevent it presented a new it the narrative felt both familiar and new to me so i just really responded well to it and i'm really excited to see where it'll go that yeah i i, I liked it i i guess i could see people n not liking it for things but i think that it was exploring that responsibly anyway so I, I really loved that one I'll be interested to see what's next um okay so I also read we set the dark on fire by Taylor K Mejia uh, sorry I have all my authors over here because I can't remember everybody's names um, so this is a dystopian fiction set in a country called I think it's Medio um it's very you know handmaid's tale kind of esque our protagonist daniela is graduating from this school where she has been trained to be a primera so basically she is the first wife to this to this upstanding citizen man that she's being married to at graduation day and she is going to handle like the public imagery of things she's the head of the household but there's always two wives so there's a segunda as well who is more of the nurturing i think she, the idea is that she bears the children so very handmaid's tale-esque in that way but she's also gone to this school and so on the this day daniela is paired with her husband who's set to become the next you know leader of this dystopian world but she's also paired up with her kind of mortal enemy in school um, carmen who is going to be the segunda and then additionally in addition to just you know that there is a rebellion going on she's been approached by parts of a member of the rebellion and kind of blackmailed into giving them information because she is going to be in this really prominent household so it's kind of her coming into her own especially as she comes from she has some secrets she comes from a darker past that's a little bit more downtrodden so it just kind of like follows her as she navigates this new world we don't get to see a whole lot of the school which i was a little sad about um but i think it you know starts the narrative on daniela's the cusp of her journey on her growth i think it starts in a right the right spot i just would have liked to have seen more of that uh ease in a little bit more get to know her a little bit more before her world changes 
because sometimes like I can see the pieces working in this a little bit more than than I really wanted to I really liked it I thought the ending was really good I just I guess I, I, I could see the pieces and that's not necessarily a bad thing especially as I read a lot uh, I just I just wanted to be a little bit more completely drawn in I definitely think it's worth a read the cover is really really gorgeous with its papel picado and the second one I think is gonna have the same color just like in a blue green color scheme so I after the ending I really am excited to see where it goes I think it did fun things there the, the guy was complete throw away like right so he's kind of like just this stand-in for like all the evils in the world almost I, I don't know how I feel about that I'll be interested to see if he is more complicated in the second I don't know if we need him to be complicated but that's just kind of the, the function he's serving right now uh, okay so I also just finished Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno Garcia uh, the light is like going off of this um, shiny library cover but this was utterly gorgeous it's been making the rounds I was like Ooh, fairy tale underworld I'm in so it follows Cassiopeia Tan as she it lives in like a small village in Mexico around in the 20s so like jazz era and she's not happy with her life she's kind of basically a servant for her grandfather and her cousin Martine who doesn't treat her well because you know she's the poor poor relative her mother had her father was a, like a poet or something and her he passed away and her mother kind of came back and had to kind of beg for her place back and so she's not being treated well and one day she opens this chest in her grandfather's room and accidentally lets it out a Mayan god and starts this journey to restore him to his throne in the underworld and also it starts her journey in getting out of this small town and seeing the world and bobbing her hair and living her best life uh, it's really gorgeous and it really explores the family dynamic between Cassiopeia and Martine really well because Martine is put up as Cassiopeia's foil right so he becomes kind of like the champion for the other Mayan god and that had imprisoned what was his name anyway so he becomes the champion for the other Mayan god and has to kind of like he doesn't want to leave this small town he is the epitome of big fish in a small pond he got himself kicked out of boarding school because he didn't like not being the big man on campus not having that power so it's just really it, it and it's really fairy tale esque so it's one of those that like kind of alludes in I think there's a line somewhere in here well we're not in a fairy tale but it's very much written like a fairy tale in the best possible way uh, I really loved it uh, it reads quick especially because it's that kind of fairy tale nature because of that it, it, it can feel surface level at times but because it's written as a fairy tale that works I don't need to know like everything this Mayan god is thinking because he's not a normal character right like his wants and needs are different anyway he wants to regain his power he's not a human but the the language is just so gorgeous I didn't like make mark any particular passages but I love it it was great we shall read it and then the last book I just finished yesterday was American Royals by Catherine McGee Hmm. Okay, so it was interesting and I did find myself getting caught up in the narrative Especially yesterday when I started it. It was really slow I actually started that one before Gods of Jade and Shadow and I was like I need to set this down. I'm not really connecting with this right now um, I want to read that fairy tale I have in my pile so American Royals is set up on this idea of if America had been a monarchy instead of a democracy um, it kind of stems from that story of George Washington being offered the crown and turned it down so it's this okay what if he had accepted it and it has a lot of what it thinks I think are tongue-in-cheek references to oh what if, well, what if America was a democracy and it was more tongue than cheek to be completely honest um, it was interesting because it, it took parts of like the I never really got a sense for the government because there were like dukes and 
gentry, but there was also mentions to there being a Supreme Court. And there are elected officials, I believe. Uh, the, the government seat is still in Washington, I, I think. That's what it seemed to be, but it never really tells us why. Like, there's a lot of political maneuverings that got the gover like capital moved to Washington, D.C. So without being told why, I don't know why in a monarchy world, that is where that ended up. Um, it tried, it tried to be inclusive. One of the characters, Nina, is um, Latina and it makes reference to some Native American or American Indian dukes, but it also references how like that was a change that had to be instigated. It does reference slavery, but it doesn't really grapple with slavery. So it was hard because it wanted to be this very like gossipy, Gossip Girl-esque, you know, soap opera narrative, but it was with royalty and it didn't want to deal with a lot of the baggage of American history. And I think maybe because I'm not, you know, I'm from America, so maybe I can read things about royalty in Europe without thinking as deeply about the colonization behind that monarchy because that's there and I'm aware of it. So maybe my own, you know, political history in this country or knowledge or, you know, just being growing up around it made it harder for that, you know, escapism to really take root with this one. That being said, it was fun. A lot, it was told from the, the point of view of four girls in this narrative. You've got Beatrice, the crown princess, who's set being like getting ready to take over the throne whenever, right? So she's going to be the first queen of America in her own right. Her sister Sam, who is the spare, because she's the second child, and as of this generation, women can inherit. Um, they also have a Sam, Sam has a twin brother, Jeff, who is important in the narrative in that Sam's best friend, Nina, starts dating Jeff and also Jeff's ex-girlfriend, Daphne, is trying to get back together with him. So, yeah. It was interesting because Daphne and Jeff's best friend, Ethan, felt very like Chuck and Blair-esque to me. So I, I guess I'm and from the show, I didn't finish the Gossip Girl series because I actually didn't like the books. I would be interested in revisiting them though because after, I, I, I love Edith Wharton, and after reading, I think it was House of Mirth, I was like, oh, I think this is the roots of Gossip Girl, especially with like Lily Bart in Gossip Girl is like an Edith Wharton character. So I would like to revisit that. And if someone wants to write me an essay about Gossip Girl and Edith Wharton, or knows of one, let me read that, that please. Yes. Um, so I, and I think it's hard because now young adult literature has changed a lot, right? So it's hard to remember that like 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, every time you walked into a young adult section, it was all Gossip Girl, the A-list, like you couldn't get away from it. It was everywhere, the click. Like, so this seems rooted in those traditions but it's much longer so it's like over 400 pages and things like Gossip Girl and the A-list and the click and whatnot were like 200 pages around ish very series-esque so this is like something that's taken the series tradition of young adult I think it's being modeled if there's a second one I don't know if there's gonna be a third one so it's being kind of put into this trilogy series model of young adult that we have now and I think that it the arc of the story makes sense to me. I just feel like it was a little long. And part of it was that you needed to get all the four narrators time. Um, and I think they did all grow in ways. They all did have personalities that were separate, but they were all kind of bland, to be honest. And a lot of the problem, the, pro the whole problem of the novel was this like love triangle that could very easily be solved, especially in these higher power structures. So, okay, so this has been bothering me. So spoiler, spoiler alert, if you have not read American Royals, 
don't listen if you don't want to hear spoilers. Okay, so Beatrice is being basically told by her parents that she needs to get married. She needs to find someone to to be her king consort. Her father reveals that he has cancer and he is not going to be around much longer and she is going to be taking over the throne. So she starts dating in the public eye this guy named Teddy. Again, they try to like wrap Theodore up in American history in a way that without the Roosevelt it just feels weird. Anyway, so she starts dating this guy named Teddy who Sam, her sister, had met at this party before she knew or he knew that he was there basically to interview for the position of king consort and they like made out in a coat cup closet had some chemistry i guess so sam is really upset because she sees this happening she doesn't understand why beatrice is going after him when she doesn't like him and sam does like him and they're already kind of at odds and beatrice is in love with her guard and for a while the problem was like, okay, so the sisters aren't talking, so there's a lack of communication. But midway through the book, or three-fourths or whatever, the sisters do start talking. They're on the same team. I was like, okay, we have a pub. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this isn't the solution, but I couldn't help thinking the whole time, like, okay, so they have a pub. Teddy and Beatrice are together in public, and behind the scenes, you just live your lives how you wanna? Like, because your public persona is a public persona anyway. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's living a lie. Maybe that's not being true to yourself. But it, it felt like a solution to people who are really worried about, you know, their responsibilities, which I'd give them credit for. Beatrice is very worried about her responsibilities to the American people. In theory, I guess I never really see it. I don't know what her responsibilities to the American people are. Um... I don't know we'll see maybe they'll get to the answer maybe it'll take them like 800 pages to get to the answer i'd been screaming for a, a while it feels like the narrative really wants like beatrice to buck tradition though and take on a commoner husband i don't know maybe i just read too much fan fiction but it feels like there's a solution right there if you want to take it okay i'm gonna stop babbling about this spoilers over it was fine. I enjoyed it. I'll probably read the second one just to figure out if my theory comes to fruition. We'll see. Okay, so I'm going to be reading a lot more this week, hopefully. I have a very ambitious stack. Um, I'm reading Gideon the Ninth right now, hoping to move into Well Met. I, I plan my stack based on my plans, so we'll see. All right, well, tell me if you've read American Royals and you think that there is a solution, whether it's my solution or not. Tell me if you've read other books. Let's chat more soon. Okay, I'm gonna go now. <laughs>